This video takes two and a half hours to give an overview of 5,000 years of landscape architecture history in the British Isles. It does this by bringing together shorter videos about 10 art historical periods. Prehistoric, Roman, Medieval, Renaissance, Baroque, Neoclassical, Romantic, Arts and Crafts, Abstract Modern and Post-Abstract, Postmodern Landscape Architecture. The British Isles have always had close connections with continental Europe and most of the cultural trends were shared. The average length of the 10 component videos is 15 minutes and each of them is in two parts. The first part is about the landscape architecture of settlements and the second part with most of the examples is about the design of landscapes and gardens. Most of the history is explained with music, images and captions. There's very little talk, you may be pleased to hear. I define landscape architecture as the composition of five primary elements to make good outdoor space. We compose landform, water and vegetation with buildings and paving aiming to make outdoor space with good social, functional and visual qualities. Landscape architects do this and so do garden designers. The difference is that one group normally works for communities and organisations. The other group normally designs pleasure gardens for private individuals. The first section of the full video is about prehistoric landscape architecture. It has no information about pleasure gardens because there probably weren't any before the Roman conquest of Britain in 43 AD. One could date the beginning of landscape architecture outside the British Isles from Gobekli Tepe, begun about 9,000 years ago, or with Geoffrey Jellicoe, one could trace the ideas to cave paintings done about 30,000 years ago. With either of these dates, landscape architecture is an older art than building architecture. By definition, there are no written records of what we call prehistoric monuments, but there is physical evidence of their having been conceived in relation to landscapes. Like us, the people who made them needed safety, security, comfort and a spiritual dimension to their lives. Their belief systems were animist. Divine powers were associated with the sun, water, mountains, forests and other features. They made a variety of circular and sacred places, including stone circles, henges, funeral sites and hill forts. The rest of this video attempts to convey the character of human-influenced prehistoric landscapes. The mood of prehistoric man-influenced landscapes was sacred and mysterious, as is the siren song which accompanies the images in this video. It's the first of ten videos covering the last 5,000 years of British garden and landscape design. Using period music, some paintings and a lot of photographs, they aim to express what designers had in their hearts when they made the places. I think of them as music videos. Another 10 videos using words and images will aim to set out what the designers were thinking about. Making gardens, as Cartier-Bresson said of photographs, should involve the brain, the eye and the heart.
Vitruvius Pollio, a Roman who lived in the first century BC, was a military engineer with interests in buildings, clocks, harbours and the landscape architecture of fortified cities. For reasons of health, comfort and firmness, Vitruvius advised that cities should be planned in relation to landscape conditions, soils, water and winds. Aristotle attributes the invention of grid street planning to Hippodamus, who lived four centuries before Vitruvius. But there are grid cities older than Hippodamus' hometown, Miletus. A grid of tracks was a standard feature of Roman army camps and of the colonial cities they often became. Naples and Pompeii are famous examples of grid cities. They had busy, shop-lined streets, and in Pompeii there are examples of lush courtyard gardens with no windows onto the streets. Roman London was also planned on a grid and had courtyard gardens, though few details survive. The Forum was in the centre of the city, and important buildings were located on the south-facing riverbank including the Praetorium, the Hot Baths and the Temple. The alignment of the road grid followed Vitruvius' recommendation to give streets as much shelter as possible from the prevailing winds. The character of Roman streets and gardens is shown in the rest of this video, which is about the mood of Roman gardens. The mood of Roman gardens was domestic and religious. So the images in the video are accompanied by two pieces of music. The Siciliano by Bach, which has a slow, lilting rhythm and is said to have been influenced by Italy. And by a Dorian composition composed and played by Anton Platonov. He plays it on the double flute, the aulos, as in Greece, its main use in Rome was with singing. There's also some bird song, which the Romans loved.
the landscape architecture of the high and late Middle Ages from 1000 to 1500 AD was more sophisticated than one might think. Cities had organic street patterns and defensive walls that formed the clearest boundaries between cities and their landscape settings. Church spires were usually the tallest buildings, which created wonderful landscape compositions. Cities were not concrete jungles. They were the glittering centres of civilization. Castles also had significant locations in landscapes. Some had man-made lakes and most had managed hunting forests. Pleasure gardens took the form of small herbers for ladies, lovers and minstrels, as you can see in the rest of this video. The mood of medieval gardens was saintly and romantic. So, the set of images in the video is accompanied by both sacred and secular music, including a piece by Hildegard of Bingen, a Gregorian chant and folk song.
Renaissance landscape architecture was based on a rebirth of the Roman system of gridded roads. And in Renaissance Italy, there was a striking similarity between the geometry of town designs and garden designs. Town squares derived from Greek agoras and Roman forums. And Leon Battista Alberti, a complete Renaissance man, followed Vitruvius in recommending a three to two ratio between the length and breadth of urban squares. He advocated specialised squares for different markets, gold, silver, wood and so forth. Some market squares were made in England, but garden squares became much more popular. As shown in the rest of this video, Garden designs for old castles and new country houses resembled town plans. Or one could say, probably with more accuracy, that the extension plans for 18th century London, Edinburgh and Bath resembled garden plans. <laughs> The mood of Renaissance gardens, but not of Renaissance politics, was ordered and calm. So, the set of images in the video is accompanied by John Dowland's Fantasia No. 7, which is rhythmic and emotional. He lived from 1563 to 1626, composed for the lute and was influenced by dance music.
avenues of the outstanding difference between Renaissance and Baroque planning. But in England, they were often additions to Renaissance layouts rather than the organising principle of designs for parks and gardens. Sixtus V, having experimented with axial lines in his own garden at Montalto, applied the idea to the centre of Rome when he became Pope in 1521. In the 17th century, André Le Nôtre gave Paris its first avenues, and Christopher Wren used the idea in his unadopted plan for rebuilding London after the 1666 Great Fire. London's first avenues were in its royal park. Pierre L'Enfant's avenue plan for Washington, D.C. was drawn up in 1791 and London's Mall was changed from a park walk to a ceremonial avenue in 1913. As shown in the following video, most English avenues were additions to Renaissance gardens. The mood of Baroque gardens was grand and outward looking. So the set of images in the video is accompanied by Handel's water music. This was commissioned by George I to impress his English subjects and was first played in 1717 on a trip in the Royal Barge rowing up the Thames from Whitehall Palace in central London.
The strongest influence of neoclassical landscape architecture was on country estates. Most of England's great parks, which had been in Renaissance and Baroque styles, were transformed into imitations of the classical landscapes of antiquity. Clients and their designers hoped to give physical form to what, in his book on Landscape into Art, Sir Kenneth Clark described as the most enchanting dream which has ever consoled mankind, the myth of a golden age in which man lived on the fruits of the earth, peacefully, piously, with primitive simplicity, and with a harmony between man and nature. How they did it will be shown in the remainder of this video. The mood of neoclassical gardens was well-balanced, harmonious and far-reaching. So the set of images in the video is accompanied by music from Haydn's London Symphony. The Andante is serene and cheerful, abundant in love and bliss as though before the fall.
Romantic landscape architecture influenced cities through the creation of public parks and through the idea of integrating cities and landscapes with a smooth transition from urban to rural. This was done with greenways and parkways in 19th century America and in 20th century London. The public parks they linked up were made for the pleasure, health and education of urban populations, with the education coming from collections of botanical specimens and of eclectic design styles, as will be illustrated in the rest of this video. The mood of romantic gardens was exciting but also calm. So, the set of images in the video is accompanied by the pas de deux from Tchaikovsky's Nutcracker Suite. Like Victorian gardens, the music is profound, emotional, sugary and romantic.
is most evident in the planning of housing projects, which in Britain included garden cities and what was called housing on garden city lines. The idea, as illustrated in the rest of this video, was that as in pre-Renaissance and pre-Raphaelite times, everyone could live in cottage-style homes, growing their own vegetables, making their own things, and enjoying the sight of exotic plants in nature-like compositions and wild gardens. The mood of arts and crafts gardens was mellow and traditional. So, the set of images in the video is accompanied by one of the best-loved English folk songs, Greensleeves. It dates from the 16th century and is played on a lute. This is followed by Elgar's Serenade for Strings, which is music of the outdoors, youth, romance and charm. It looks back and it also looks forward. Thank you. 
abstract modernist landscape architecture appealed to designers much more than it appealed to their clients. In large part, this was because people loved the symbols and stories which modernist designers abjured. As shown in the rest of this video, they were, if sometimes charmed, often confused by the analytical approach and indeed by abstract art itself. The mood of abstract gardens, which were a serious matter, rests on analysis and on synthesis. So, the set of images in the video is accompanied by music composed for the Triadic Ballet by Paul Hindemith. He was a teacher in the school which gave 3D form to modernism, the Bauhaus.
Post-abstract landscape architecture is in its early days, partly because of the intellectual timidity of the profession and its clientele. But the prospects are enchanting, and we may find, once again, that gardens are telling stories and serving as crucibles for the development of new urban landscapes, particularly at rooftop level. The mood of post-abstract gardens is pluralist and internationalist, as well as being relatively gentle and non-ideological. So, the set of images in the video is accompanied by music by Akash Gandhi. He's very popular on YouTube and described by Wikipedia as widely known for his musical arrangements, which blend piano and world elements. Typical user comments are that his music is beautiful, peaceful and calming. 